allow me to join you in expressing uh, my sorrow upon the passing of Senator Enzi, with whom I had the privilege of working in my prior tenure in the Department of Homeland Security, and allow me uh, to join you, uh, please, in expressing uh, my prayers and thoughts uh, for his family at this difficult time. Every day, the 240,000 public servants of the Department of Homeland Security confront an increasingly complex and dynamic threat landscape. They do so with unflinching dedication to our mission and a deep sense of purpose. I'm here today to ask for your continued support of their work. As you know, it is the resources afforded by this Congress that enable my outstanding colleagues to keep the American people safe and that enable us to recruit and retain our nation's most talented professionals. The President's fiscal year 2022 budget helps us meet these essential goals. First, the President's budget invests in a secure border. It directs $1.2 billion toward more effective and modern port and border security, including a $655 million investment toward modernizing our land ports of entry. Another $47 million to integrate Customs and Border Protection detection capabilities and robust investments in border surveillance technology. There is no request for additional border wall construction. Our team at Customs and Border Protection employs a wide array of proven tactics and cutting edge technology to defend the American people against dangerous threats to our borders. To support this challenging task, the President's budget includes $37 million to integrate aerial border security technologies that will provide a common operating picture for law enforcement. This will enable our Border Patrol agents, regardless of their location, to act based on consistent shared information. This is absolutely essential to protecting our homeland in the 21st century, and it is just a snapshot of the incredible work being done on the front lines as part of our layered approach to border security. I urge you respectfully to support the President's budget for these requested investments for smart and its strategic border security measures. Second, consistent with the President's recently released immigration blueprint calling for safe, orderly, and humane policies and practices to govern immigration, this budget reflects our administration's commitment to rebuilding our system into one that is fair, efficient, and upholds our nation's values and our laws. It includes a new discretionary request for $345 million for U.S. citizenship and immigration services to reduce the backlog of applications and petitions, ramp up interview capacity, and meet our goal of welcoming up to 125,000 refugees per year. To ensure the safe and humane treatment of migrants at the southwest border, the request includes $163 million for medical needs for those in Customs and Border Protection custody. Third, the budget tackles a rising threat to our national security, cyber attacks. The President is requesting new resources for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, as it is commonly known, which leads the effort to defend against cyber threats and promote resilience across the federal government. We are seeking $2.1 billion for cyber activities, which builds on the $650 million already provided to CISA in the American Rescue Plan. This funding will help CISA respond to government-wide breaches, increase cyber defenses, hire qualified experts, and obtain support services to protect and defend critical infrastructure and federal IT systems. Fourth, the President's budget invests in what we need to prepare for increasingly costly, devastating, and frequent natural disasters. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has stepped up to meet this challenge, but the challenge is one that requires new resources. This budget invests $532 million above the fiscal year 2021 enacted level to help FEMA and its workforce combat the realities 
of climate change in an equitable way, including significant commitments to pre-disaster planning and climate resilience grant programs that benefit communities across the country. Finally, this budget invests necessary resources in one of our top priorities at the Department of Homeland Security, combating the growing threat of domestic violent extremism. Domestic terrorism is the most lethal and persistent terrorism-related threat to the United States today. That is why we are requesting $131 million to support innovative methods to prevent domestic terrorism while respecting privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. The funding also lifts up, lifts up vital research on the root causes of radicalization, enhanced community outreach, and locally driven prevention efforts. It is one of the great honors of my life to serve alongside the dedicated public servants of the Department of Homeland Security. Their commitment to a complex and dynamic Homeland Security mission is unwavering, and I am committed to ensuring they are resourced, compensated, and recognized appropriately. I ask for your continued support and partnership in this effort. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to discussing the President's budget priorities for the Department, and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary Mayorkas. Um, you know, as you know, this, this past year, we've seen hackers uh, target our, our water supply. The, the Chinese government has exploited vulnerabilities in, in Microsoft services. The Russian uh, government conducts cyber espionage against uh, dozens of federal agencies, and cyber criminals are attacking our critical infrastructure. Uh, this budget does uh, contain a request for $2.1 billion uh, for CISA, but could you please tell the committee uh, uh, why this uh, figure is sufficient for us to deal with uh, these attacks? Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, the, the budget recognizes the fact that cybersecurity is not only a matter of homeland security, but national security as well. And it invests in every dimension of our defense to this increasing threat to the homeland and to our country. It resources CISA uh, to develop response teams that, it, that can assist not only federal government agencies across the enterprise, but state, local, tribal, and territorial partners, as well as, and critically, the private sector in understanding the threat, building their prevention capabilities, as well as their resilience should they be victimized by a cyber threat. It invests in our greatest resource of all, our human capital. We are underway in executing the largest cybersecurity hiring initiative in the department's history. We invest in technology and the capabilities that we have as a department to address this increasing threat. Technology. Uh, human resources, the human capital, the talent, and uh, also increasing our footprint throughout the country so that we are present and more able and nimble to respond to events wherever they may, might occur and support our partners from border to border and sea to sea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, Mr. Secretary, as you know, Canada will soon begin to reopen its border with the United States, allowing those who are fully vaccinated to cross uh, the border. U.S. restrictions, however, remain essentially unchanged since the beginning of the pandemic, and those restrictions are hurting the cross-country communities uh, in Michigan, uh, as well as all along the, uh, the northern border. So my question for you, Mr. Secretary, is what criteria are you using to inform the decisions on restricting cross-border travel with Canada? Mr. Chairman, we are of mindful of and monitoring every single day the economic impact of the travel restrictions. Our greatest priority is the health and safety of the American people. Uh, just uh, uh, last week, uh, I spoke with my counterpart uh, in Canada, Minister Blair. Uh, I was aware of the measure that Canada would take, and we are watching the trajectory of the pandemic, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. We are watching the Delta variant very carefully. 
and we will lift those restrictions in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control when uh, the arc of the pandemic so warrants. This is a public health decision. We are mindful of the economic impacts and we urge the American people who have not yet been vaccinated to get their vaccines. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated at this point. Well, as you uh, monitor this uh, situation, uh, Mr. Secretary, is it possible that the department will consider easing restrictions based on, uh, on type of travel across the border from uh, Canada? So for example, will immediate relatives of US citizens and green card holders soon be permitted uh, to enter from Canada? Mr. Chairman, we are looking at not only the economic impacts, uh, but the other impacts on people's lives. The fact that uh, families have not seen one another uh, across the border. We are looking at all the different ways uh, that we can compartmentalize the issue and see whether we can allow certain flows or ease certain uh, restrictions in a limited way without imperiling the public health and safety of the American people, as well as the people of Canada. This is something that we're looking at very carefully and in many different ways. I commit to you to continue that close study on a daily basis. Well, we appreciate that. And it does uh, require that kind of uh, daily uh, look, I believe. So uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you on this, Mr. Secretary. I can tell you the impact uh, is significant in my state and other states on the northern border. Mr. Secretary, in 2020, the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center found that cybercrime victims in Michigan saw a loss of nearly $84 million. And we know that malicious actors are increasingly relied on ransomware attacks to extort ransoms uh, from these victims. I understand that early in your tenure at DHS, you launched a ransomware sprint to begin tackling this issue. So if you could uh, please um, let this committee know how you're organizing the department to assist uh, public and private entities to prevent and to respond to ransomware attacks. Mr. Chairman, ransomware is one of the greatest cyber uh, security threats that we face. We have seen um, a 300% increase in ransomware attacks uh, over last year. We have seen uh, more than $300 million in losses this year alone to ransomware. We are working in close coordination with our federal partners and the private sector to educate the private sector about the steps that they can take to best guard against a ransomware attack. In fact, not only did we start a ransomware sprint well before the colonial pipeline attack that galvanized the public attention for all the right reasons, but just last week we launched the StopRansomware.gov website, the first of its kind, which is a one-stop clearinghouse for information related to ransomware. How businesses, small, medium, and large, how American residents, the American public can protect themselves by backing up their systems, by changing their passwords, the blocking and tackling that is easy, accessible, and can really make a difference.